Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. On this special edition, we feature interviews and exclusive excerpts from our sit downs with three celebrated talk show hosts. We begin with Bill Maher. Bill Maher, he says he aims to keep it real on his long running HBO show and he's okay if that offends people in the process. Chief election and campaign correspondent Robert Costa spoke with Barr about booking his sometimes controversial guests. Can you make an audience laugh and think at the same time? Totally, of course. I don't understand this. No cameras at the Supreme Court. I don't get this. You can film everything in America. You can barely go to the washroom on a plane without it being filmed. <laughs> the great thing about laughter is that it's involuntary. So if you laugh at something, something in you tells you that's true. It must be true. I laughed at it. Maybe I wasn't supposed to. A study of eight developed countries found that U.S. students were dead last in math skills, but number one in confidence in math skills. <laughs> Even though they suck at it. Yes, we're number one in thinking we're number one. If you catch yourself laughing at something Bill Maher has said lately on HBO's Real Time, his Friday night perch for the past 21 years, just be careful. Next time, the joke could be on you. How long have you been, you've been doing this for so long? This interview? It, well, does seem, it does seem like it. Nobody is spared Bill Maher's humor. Political TV is full of groans and eye rolls. And or as he sees it, his truth telling, not on the right. If you're gonna turn over your party to a foreign power, at least pick the right one. Russia, are you kidding? It's like the Republicans looked over all the companies they could merge with and pick Sears. <laughs> Nor on the left. You call yourself the resistance, then fight behind enemy lines. That's what a resistance does. That's the difference between blowing up a tank and tweeting about it. Get out of your echo chamber and infiltrate theirs. What is the through line through everything you write and everything you say? Uh, keep it real, you know? Don't be tribal. Don't say something just because that's going to make the audience of one side applaud or boo. Practical solutions as opposed to ideological. And, uh, don't pull a punch. We have a great show. It's the 68-year-old Marr has been swinging at targets high and low his entire career, taking his own share of knocks along the way. But he still gladly courts controversy. The right response to speech you don't like is more speech, not the lazy, cowardly response of canceling people. That attitude explains the title of his book. It's compiled from years of Marr's commentary on real time. I wanted to see if the world had changed or I had changed more. I was excavating, reading over all these editorials from years and years and years. And I wanted to find that answer. I speak for the normies, you know. I, I speak for that, I think, vast middle that is tired of the partisanship. Um, I don't want to hate half the country, and I don't hate half the country. You write a lot of, throughout this book that the left irritates you, frustrates you at times. But the right often alarms you. Yes. <laughs> They're very alarming. They're extremely alarming. <clears throat> More alarming. What do you say to your critics, though, who say, then you should just focus on them, Bill. If they're more alarming to you than the left, then why not shine the spotlight on them only? The truth isn't one-sided like that. The Democrats constantly are uh, running against Trump with the idea, you people out there couldn't possibly vote for this guy. And, and people are saying, watch me, hold my beer, watch me vote for him again. Instead of just saying, oh, he's lied. We know he's a liar. He's Donald Trump. He can't help himself. He's crazy. I mean, I think literally crazy. I think there's a, a kind of a level of malignant narcissism, which is not just a personality quirk. It's diagnosable. And he suffers from it. Trump has made over 8,000 false or misleading statements as president. Nothing like this has ever happened before. If you had him on real time, what would you ask him? <laughs> would you please go away? Have you asked him to come on? Of course. We've asked everybody. 
I mean, of that stature. Um, he knows he has an open invitation to come on, but I don't think he really hates me because I think he this I, I, the the amount of times that he goes after me. He watches the show accidentally. It's always accidentally. <laughs> he watches it accidentally every week. It's amazing. In fact, conservatives don't shy away from real time. He is the former attorney general. Wow, under Presidents George H.W. Bush and Donald Trump, Bill Barr. Is on when Bill Barr came on your show, what did some of your Democratic friends say? Yeah, this is exactly what I hate about this country. How dare you? How dare you platform someone? The way I see it, we, we are moving, becoming a much more secular society, just 55 But years. that's by free will. That's good. I mean, I, no, it's, it's good, good that people, people do have free will. Oh, good. Okay? And, and they, should, <laughs> they should be able... They should be able... <laughs> yeah. So you're going to have to talk to people. And maybe you'll find out that they're not the monsters you think they are. I mean, do I apologize for Bill Barr's... Uh, I thought horrible behavior when the when the Mueller report came out and he basically uh, lied about it. I don't. But look, this is what I call a good as it gets Republican. He came out and said Trump lost the election. That's the main thing in the Republican Party right now. Do you believe elections count only if you win? As good as it gets could well be Mars' motto for politics. I certainly have my quarrels with the left. And for life. To me, these are probably the good old days. It could get a lot worse. Not wishing for what could be, but recognizing are, what he sees is real. And taking you on if you're not. You say you're cynical about politics? Don't flatter yourself. Cynical comes when you know too much. You, on the other hand, haven't bothered to learn anything. <laughs> and now here's an exclusive extended interview from Robert Costa's chat with Bill Maher, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. You're not just a comedian. I mean, no. the whole culture kind of looks to people on TV, to comics, for political guidance. It's almost how the whole country seems to function now. I feel like most of the other ones, they're playing to just a amen choir that's already there. They're saying something to make the people go, yes, absolutely. That's not what I'm doing. I'm saying things that very often upset people or just at least make them think. Just consider the other side. Consider this. Um, sometimes these editorials start out one way and some of the people be like, yeah, that's, and then halfway through, it's like, oh, wait, what's he saying now? Yeah, because I'm, I'm presenting the other side. It's one thing I hate about the media these days is I never feel like I get the full story from anybody. You're always just presenting the things that you want me to hear to make you be on your side in this issue. It's always about the narrative, never about the truth. I have to read things from all over the spectrum to get the full story. Well, I'm trying to buck that trend. Biden allies, they keep saying this election's about democracy. You buy that argument? Yes. Well, who was the one who kept saying Trump is never going to leave and everyone was laughing at? That would be me for years. I have so many Republicans I could play the tapes who were on the show and I would present that with them and they'd, oh, Bill, you smoke too much pot. And, no, apparently I smoked just the right amount of pot because I had that right. So um, just because it didn't happen in 2020... It uh, doesn't mean it won't happen in 2024. I mean, very often there's a dress rehearsal for something horrific. And Trump learned from 2020. He thought he could rely on certain Republicans just because they were Republicans. That's the phone call to Georgia. Can you find me 11,000 votes? And what we found out is that there are a lot of Republicans who are patriots. And they're not Trumpers. I mean, there's too many who are and who don't understand what democracy is anymore uh, and will back Trump no matter what he says or does, and that's a cult. But there's also ones like that Raffsenberger guy in Georgia who did the right thing and said, look, I voted for you, Mr. President. I wanted you to win, but we can count here in Georgia. We did it. You lost. Be a man. Get over it. You say in the book, 
people shouldn't go to college these days. I was way ahead on that one. Democrats have this idea that college solves everything. That if we could just get everybody to be more sitting in a classroom looking at a blackboard and taking notes, things would just be better in this country. And it's not true. It wasn't true, and it's ever less true the more crazy colleges become. Instead of trying to get everybody to go into college, which is just a big scam with the loans and the money, uh, just make college less necessary, which it is for almost every job. It's just not that necessary. Do you have to go to medical school? Yes, of course, law school. But for most things, it's just a, it's a scam. It's a ticket to the middle class. If you look at the statistics, the people who have a college degree, they just make a lot more money. What do you make of the generational divide in this country? A lot of older people might hear what you say, not along. Younger people go, you just don't get it. <laughs> well, some of the some of the younger Democrats. Yeah, I mean, that to me, that's Republicans. one of the funniest chapters that I enjoyed putting together the most was the one on generations. Generations is just a funny subject. It always has been for comedians. I mean, of course, everybody gets older and they think the young people are crazy. It's, a, one of, again, one of those things you have to examine, look hard at yourself. Do I look at this thing and not like it because I'm older and it's just newer, or is it actually stupid? Sometimes new is better, and sometimes new is just new for the sake of being new. You know Whoopi Goldberg from, well, just about everywhere. The co-host of ABC's The View for the last 16 years. Sat down with our Seth Doan to discuss her career and a recent memoir. Whoopi Goldberg has been in the spotlight for four decades. Whoopi, give us that smile. Ah, yeah. Here this we, is here your we spot. Go. This is this is it. This is it. This is everything. What she Ooh. craves today is this quiet spot in the sun. Lots of people just need some place they can go and just. She's found a vacation home and tranquility on the Italian island of Sardinia. The more I wrote about my mom, I thought I would have loved to have given this to her. Same with my brother. She's been thinking a lot about her mother, Emma, and brother, Clyde, who both passed away. They're subjects of her new memoir, which is out this week. In the book, you paint your childhood as pretty idyllic here. And it was. <laughs> it was very lucky. Before taking the name Whoopi Goldberg, she was Karen Johnson, growing up in this housing project in New York City's Chelsea neighborhood. For me, it was a great time. And to be able to have the freedom with a mother who really just said, listen, you're going to have to figure some of this out for yourself. I can't give you all the answers. Her mom was a teacher here, and when the young Karen Johnson dropped out of school, she made a pact with her mom to use the city's museums and libraries to keep learning. You know, a lot of folks had two parents. I only had one. And that parent acted like 900 people. <laughs> you know, she never made it about what we didn't have. She made it about what we did have and how to celebrate that. So like he said, like, what's the problem? Whoopi like, Goldberg like, started like, acting on stage, got to Broadway. And I'm like, whoa. And landed an Oscar okay. nomination for her first major film role. Until you do right by me, everything you think about is going to cross. I will follow him. For a period, it said she became the highest paid actress in Hollywood. What a dance sister. Why? You don't have any rhythm. <laughs> She'd also see her mom had a talent for acting, like when Marlon Brando stopped by. My mother would turn into uh, the other Emma. She came in and I, and I got up specifically to say as she's coming towards us, don't be freaked out, that is Marlon Brando sitting on the couch, but I couldn't, so all I could say was, hey mom, come meet Marlon Brando. <laughs> who came to visit us. And she just went like this, Mr. Brando. I was just like, wait, wait, who are you? After making more than 100 films, 
here, there are lots of places to sit. Come. Even in Italy, Hollywood is never far. Patrick Swayze wanted you yeah, in the ghost. ghost. Yeah. It's funny, this particular part of the peninsula reminds me of him. Molly, you're in danger. Now you can't just blurt it out like that and quit moving around, will you? Because you start to make me dizzy. I just tell her in my own way. Molly, you in danger, girl. Goldberg won an Oscar for the supporting role she played as a psychic a in Ghost. He knows where he lives. Write it down. He wants you to write it down. You write it down. I ain't no damn secretary. Just, just do it. Add to that two Emmys, Whoopi Goldberg. a Grammy, and a Tony, making her one of just about 20 people with EGOT status. Her book chronicles the start of her career and does not hold back, detailing problems with drugs, going on welfare, and learning marriage is not for her after three tries. Are you still in love with the idea of being in love or that's just gone? I think other people seem to sparkle when they're in love. And I like to see that. But for me, it's like I sparkle when I'm not in love which is kind of okay. You know, and the older I get, the happier I am. And so just in case, and I'm directing this to folks who may want to write me on the internet, here's the deal. I know how cute I am. So you don't have to tell me I'm not attractive enough to have a boyfriend because shockingly, Are you always as confident as you seem? You know, I'm, I'm very confident, but I'm also confident in the fact that I make gigantic mistakes and step in lots of poo along the way. On the talk show she's co-hosted for 16 years. Well, as it turns out, there are a lot of major issues happening. In Goldberg made a remark about the Holocaust, which she says was misunderstood. She apologized, but ABC suspended her for two weeks in 2022. When you look back at that Holocaust comment on The View, the one that you were suspended for, do you regret that? I'm in a quandary at how to answer that because people are waiting for me to say something. And I said what I had to say. They suspended me. I respected what they said. I respected everybody's opinion. Um, and if anyone's ever really interested in, it, in its entirety, they can look it up. But I, I will not uh, put myself in that position again. She's been a longtime advocate on a range of issues, often using the show as a platform. The whole idea of some man yeah. deciding what happens with my body is so abhorrent to me. The, yeah, you can see now you're on a peninsula. There's water yeah. on that side, there's water on this surrounded. side. Here in Sardinia, she can detach from the world. She motors through audiobooks, has about 9,000 of them, and sometimes just sits. Oh my gosh, how yeah. do you ever leave? Very reluctantly. <laughs> She dreams of finding a way to spend six months a year in Sardinia. I'm ready to not be scrutinized quite as, as tightly as I am. And I think the further away I get from, from opinion television, the easier it might be for a while. At 68 years old, she's a great grandmother. Whoopi Goldberg's trailblazing journey has been one of reinvention and determination. I'm a singular kind of person, I think. She says she was well equipped, starting with those lessons from her mom in that two bedroom apartment in New York. It makes her perch here all the more impressive. It's the end of a, of a peninsula. I mean, I come from the projects. I got a peninsula. This is a long way from this Chelsea. This is a long way from Chelsea. Here's an exclusive excerpt from Seth Doan's conversation with Whoopi Goldberg. Why did you want to write this book? I, th I feel like I had to. I, I feel like I needed to 
connect to my family because really it was the three of us and with them being gone, I wasn't really sure of who I was in my place, in my skin anymore, because it was always been the three of us. I've never, never knew life without the two of them. It's part memoir, it's part love letter to them. Yeah. It's part, actually, as, as kvetchy as I get about the public, it's also a love letter to the public, because I, people want to know I never understood why they wanted to know things. And I just thought, okay, so here's, here's what I can tell you. And I can tell you now because my mom's not here and my brother's not here. And this is who we were. And this is how I got to be me. And, you know, if you're not happy with it, it's put the book down, you know. In New York, you told us, I needed people to know more than they did about me. Yeah. And people have made up their minds about what they think they know. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, people, you know, we were in Chelsea. People always say, oh, you know, you grew up poor. and whatever. It's like, well, no. <laughs> Chelsea wasn't a ghetto. It was never a ghetto. People assume, because you're black, you come from this area or this was your experience. And it wasn't my experience. My experience was lots of love and, you know, figure it out. Only about 19 people in the world have achieved this. EGOT status. Yeah. It shows mastery in a, in a craft and also real range. Well, I think, you know, we, from the beginning of my career, I've always done stuff that I wanted to do. So I got my Grammy for uh, my show, I think, the, the recording of my Broadway show. The uh, Tony we got, Tom and I got, uh, because we were two of the producers of Thoroughly Modern Millie. The Emmy? The Emmy for, for the Hattie McDaniel documentary I did, and for The View. And then the Oscar. Well, Ghost, yes. When you, you've done something like 150 films, do you Maybe. have any idea? Maybe, probably. <laughs> That's a lot. It's, well, it's not when you look at really, when you look at the breadth of a career. As, as it turns out, I've been here for a while. You know, it doesn't feel like it. It still feels like I'm kind of fresh and new and figuring it out. Do you beat yourself up? Very rarely, but I do. I do. Uh, about what types of things? Just if I've been thoughtless or, or you know, I, I've not kept myself on the, on the path that I want to be on. Like, I, I try to remember. The well, the path is... Treat people the way you want to be treated. Try to be nice to the people that you're not sure you like. Just try to be better. Ken Jennings. He was living a quiet life as a computer programmer, husband, and father when he took the test that would change his life, the Jeopardy contestant test. The rest, as they say, is history. Luke Burbank led a Q&A about how Jennings went from just an average guy in Utah to Jeopardy champion and host. The category is Famous Jennings. After being expelled from Jamaica in 1716, this privateer became the unofficial governor of the Pirate Republic of Nassau. Oh, I don't know this. It's one of my pirate forefathers named Jennings. Ken Jennings might not know his trivia quite like he used to. This is the ravages of time we're witnessing. Yeah. This is like watching me turn to dust and blow away <laughs> in a chill wind. <laughs> Ken Jennings, <laughs> you are the champion. <laughs> the greatest <laughs> of all time. But that's okay if he's a little rusty, because these days Jennings gets to see all the answers long before he heads out on stage as the now host of his favorite TV show ever. It's kind of the plot of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, I guess. A retiring leader of a franchise takes, you know, five little boys and girls to see which one of them really loves his chocolate the most. And I was the one that didn't get sucked up the pipe or whatever. Alex Trebek! His Wonka, longtime and legendary host Alex Trebek, who guided the show for decades. Jeopardy! A show that turns 60 this year. As a young Mormon kid living in Korea, 
Jennings says watching Armed Forces television was his favorite way to pass the time. And his favorite thing to watch? Game shows, of course. I think it was just actually the gameplay itself. It was a version of the world with well-defined rules, where you could watch a few of them and understand the format. And as a kid, dealing with a confusing world, on game shows, game shows are different. You know, questions get answered almost immediately. You know, for a right answer, there's a nice little ping. Mm. For a wrong answer, there's an immediate buzz. Mm. It's not like life, which is messy. Game shows are, are neat and fun and easy. In college, instead of following his dreams of writing, he opted to become what he calls a bad computer programmer, figuring it was the safe choice. He married his sweetheart, Mindy, started a family, and thought that's how his life would go. Hi everyone, I'm Alex Trebek, and welcome to the Jeopardy! contestant exam. When, on a whim, he took the Jeopardy! contestant exam. When I got the call a year later saying, hey, we'd like to have you on in three weeks, I freaked out. I started watching the show very intensely, standing up behind my lazy boy at home pretending it was a podium, mashing my thumb up and down on a, like a Fisher-Price plastic toy I'd stolen from our 18-month-old, um, just pretending it was a buzzer. My wife would keep score and tell me how I was doing. It was kind of a rocky training montage. A software engineer from Salt Lake City, Utah, Ken Jennings. To this day, Jennings says nothing compares to the nerves he felt under the lights and on camera that first time he stepped on stage as a contestant. But then something amazing happened. In that first game, I found that like years of listening to the clipped rhythms of Alex Trebek really did help. Like watching the show, standing up with my fake buzzer helped. I, I kind of had the timing right away. Julia. What is New Zealand? Good. In that first game, the score was close and it all came down to final Jeopardy. And I remember Alex accepting my response. It was about the Sydney Olympics, who is Marion Jones. And I had just written down who is Jones. And Alex pauses for a second like, ooh, is that enough? Is he just guessing a last name? And so Alex looks to the judges and he gets the high sign and he says, that's correct. And I realize I'm going to be a Jeopardy champion for the rest of my life. And it was just an immediate rush of euphoria that's hard to explain. Like, as good as the birth of my kids. I, I can say that now that they're, you know, teens and out of the house. It, it was just an amazing moment. Alex would just wait, and if they didn't know it, he would be like, nope. Boop, 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 boop. Oh. That microsecond decision led to 74 straight victories, two and a half million dollars, game show immortality, and eventually, and improbably, the job of Jeopardy host. So I am standing at, you might even say, an altar of sorts that many of us trivia nerds have thought about a lot. This is the, the light pen, the telestrator, where you can write okay. down your, your name and your final Jeopardy response. Why does it seem that so many highly intelligent people have such questionable handwriting on this show? Is it something to do with the device? The pen got better. This is much nicer than the version I was trying to write with, which I think had a cord back in okay. 2004. It's funny, I'm getting flashbacks just by being here, it's almost like there are two Jeopardy sets for me. You know, yeah. there, there was this one uh -huh. back here, and there's like just a chasm between you and Alex. Jennings will admit to one possible advantage he might have in the job, his empathy for players, because he's been there himself. Still, Alex Trebek looms large. If I was ever at sea, I would just think, what would Alex do here? And often, it was to do less. He had this amazing minimalist kind of light touch where he never wanted the focus to be on himself, which is such an unusual, beautiful thing in show business. I kind of feel like even now, I, I want to be Alex Trebek when I grow up because nobody's ever going to do that job as well as he did it. Which brings us back to our game and a mistake I made earlier, which the judges caught. At the top of our story, I said they give Jennings the answers before the game, but of course, that's incorrect. They give him the questions. So where exactly did that come from? Well, from Jeopardy! creator Merv Griffin's then-wife, Julianne, the story goes. Yeah, so Merv and Julianne are on a plane coming back from vacation, and he's trying to come up with game show ideas. And she says, well, just do one of those like uh, quiz shows like they used to have. And he said, honey, we can't do those anymore. Those were all crooked. They were, they were giving the players the answers. Oh. And she thinks about it, and she says, well, that's what you should do. You should just give them the answer. <laughs> and they'll come up with the question. And he says, what do you mean? And she says, you know, 5,280 feet. And he says, what, what is, is a, a mile? mile? And that's the birth of Jeopardy right there. The birth of a TV quiz show. But more importantly, 
says Jennings, the birth of something that in a small way has helped hold us Americans together, at least for 30 minutes a night. And there's nothing trivial about that. The great and the odd thing about Jeopardy is it's kind of universally popular. Old people like Jeopardy, young people like Jeopardy, red states, blue states. It's bizarrely universal. America still agrees that there's like a half hour every day where facts do matter and we are allowed to adjudicate things as right or wrong actually based on science and history. And I do think that's an important bulwark. Again, an extended talk between Luke Burbank and Ken Jennings, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. How big of a part of your life now as the host of Jeopardy is people coming up to you and asking you, you know, or giving you answers in the form of a question? Is that a constant thing for you now? People do enjoy that. I feel <laughs> like as a contestant on this show, I would get people coming up to me on the street with very hard trivia questions. You know, so there'd always be some young gunfighter <laughs> that wanted to stump me. But now it's much more uh, nitpicking. It's kind of letters to the editor about Jeopardy. Mm. You know, dear Ken, uh, you need to look more into the, the actual Canadian pronunciation of this. Or why do you always say that's him instead of that's he? My second grade teacher, so this is now my life, being, being corrected by millions of Jeopardy viewers. And it's, it's such a pleasure. Yeah, how have you figured out how to sort of appease people who have thoughts and comments and requests like that? I mean, you just have to understand what Jeopardy means to its audience. It's really a very flattering thing. You know, there's not a lot of shows that get that kind of attention because it's not even a quiz show anymore. It's, it's a cultural institution. You know, it's Jeopardy. It's almost like it's a public utility. You know, you, your house has to be hooked up to water and gas and Jeopardy every night at seven o'clock or, you know, mom's going to freak out. And we know it means a lot in the lives of our viewers. It's part of the rhythm of their day. And we want to honor the legacy of the show and also kind of the sense of familiarity and ritual that they get out of it. Who are the kinds of folks that come up to you in the airport or walking down the street? Like, who's a typical Jeopardy viewer? There's really no stereotype. Uh, it, it, it'll be yesterday on my flight, you know, the flight attendant kind of shyly at the end is like, I'm a big fan of Jeopardy. My mom loves you, you know? But I'll also be just walking across the street in New York and somebody will be like, hey, Jeopardy! You know, it, uh, you realize that it's, uh, it's one of the last things in our culture that's monolithic, that everybody watches, you know, before things got divided into these little niches and silos. It's still a cultural reference we all have. When you're on a flight now, is it, much more likely that you will get recognized as the host of Jeopardy than you would have as the guy who's really good at Jeopardy. There's been a real uptick. The thing I noticed that I thought would never change is people have actually started saying stuff like, I'll take dumb political moves for $500, Ken, because I thought that would be, I'll take dumb political moves for $500, Alex, for the rest of our lives. And it, it usually is. But occasionally I'll, I'll hear, you know, Ken Jennings, and I'll, I'll think, that's really weird to go from being, you know, just kind of a fun part of Jeopardy, a little onlooker, a single Lego in, in the Jeopardy universe, um, to suddenly becoming uh, the face of it. It's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a shock and it's an adjustment, but it's such a pleasant one because the show always meant so much to me. Is there a, a real intentional kind of behind the scenes effort to make sure that the show stays essentially apolitical? Yeah. Uh, in particular, that meant a lot to Alex Trebek, I think. The idea that, you know, one of the reasons why he was kind of a bit of a cipher for many years is because he enjoyed the fact that he was not associated with any particular ideology. He was the face of Jeopardy, the face of these faintly old-fashioned virtues of, of knowledge and cultural literacy and fair play, and, uh, and nobody was troubled with how he voted or which cable channel he watched. And that's just hard to recapture today. That was what made Alex, one of the many things that made him hard to replace is, uh, you know, we now know what people think about the country. How do you, like, practice for, for host, your first time out hosting? Do they run you through a bunch of kind of mock games and stuff? There actually was some dress rehearsal. They had, they had the writers of the show pretend to be contestants. And they would start out being well-mannered contestants so that I could just kind of get into the rhythm of it. Uh, and then they would start to push the envelope a little and do subtly wrong things to try to see if I would do the right thing. Because the host of Jeopardy has to wear a lot of hats at once. You know, you're 
you're trying to be a perfect narrator for the show and a genial face of it, but you're also a referee adjudicating the game. You're trying to shape the pace of it a bit like an orchestra conductor. You're trying to frame it, the, the story of the game, the accounts of the game for a home audience as if you're a play-by-play -play announcer. You know, you're trying to do all these things at once, and Alex made it look easy. So I kind of assumed, yeah, you know, you just have to do, do what Alex did. But it turns out he was just incredibly able and smooth and graceful at a very hard job. Does it uh, still feel kind of unreal to you at times? Almost every day. Like I, I never want it to become old hat because I still remember that sense of awe of walking on that stage for the first time and thinking, this is, this is Jeopardy. I've been watching this at home for 20 years and now I get to, I get to be part of it for a minute. And you know, when I hear Johnny say my name, that's, that's hallucinatory, by the way, to hear, to hear Johnny Gilbert. Uh, you still expect to hear Alex Trebek. Every day I expect to hear him say, the host of Jeopardy, Alex Trebek. But, but he says my name and I have to walk out there. And I guess largely it's an honor, you know, because the history of the show means a lot to me. And I know firsthand from talking to viewers how much it means to them. I really, I, I can't just be a Jeopardy kibitzer on the sidelines. You know, I'm, I really want the show to succeed and I really want it to have the same profile it had during Alex's years, and I take that very seriously. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.